Good morning everybody, we are looking at uh, stability analysis and we are first we derived a non-linear set of equation for a model then we also had a um, linearization and we have a linear set of equation of the form d chi by dt equal to um, l chi where l is like a linear operator <coughs> and going back uh, we look for the eigenvalues in the classical stability analysis and the eigenvalues are like uh, go like 2 pi f t plus i alpha because it is complex and this is the uh, periodic part corresponding to the frequency f and alpha is the growth rate you can uh, clearly see this we have done this before. So you have uh, uh, a e power minus i 2 pi f t which is like a periodic part and e power alpha t is the exponential decay. So this is where we were and we said that uh, uh, we look at um, some other type of stability last time so let us look at that before that I just want to ask you. I uh, am not able to demonstrate it live otherwise I could have made the picture big but the internet is not working. What is this thing? Do not read what is this? Just and Viksha, what does it appear like? Yeah. It is a rabbit. Rabbit. Huh? Derek, what is it? Duck. 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 Sir. Since bird from the same like You? Yes. Duck. Um. Duck. Okay. Duck. Duck. Oh, duck. 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 So, some people say rabbit, some people say duck, some say rabbit and duck. So, what is it? It is actually both. So, uh, it is some kind of. So, you look at something and once you have an idea, I mean, if you, uh, if there was none of these things written there, perhaps you will stick with one of the views and till somebody points out that I mean now that uh, I mean there were some people said duck some said rabbit now that both are out can you see both okay and there are lots of pictures like that uh, so it is uh, so there is a book it is there in our library uh, uh, I do not know if you know this uh, uh, book the structure of scientific uh, there is a book called structure of scientific revolutions by Thomas Kuhn, uh, I cannot open this links because the internet is not working uh, with my computer. Uh, so what it says, I will give you his theory in a brief while, uh, in, 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 in brief, what he says is there is an established view of things. He gives lot of examples like discovery of oxygen, quantum mechanics, uh, all kinds of things and, and uh, several different uh, examples of how uh, something changed. So he calls, there is something called normal science and paradigm shift. So normal science is you know there is an answer, it is like what you read from the textbooks, you know there is a you read a gas dynamics textbook and textbook and there are problems and you are guaranteed that there is a solution and then you keep on solving that. So that is like a jigsaw puzzle or something, you know there is an answer. So you think there is a duck and you try to fix things to be a duck and then uh, you uh, multiply top and bottom by something add and subtract something whatever you do lot of jugglery and so on but you still are within that framework. And then comes around some guy from outside who does not know anything, who has not heard that it is a duck. In our science, the equivalent is he has not read any papers and he is young, um, arrogant, or uh, does not care. And he says it is not a duck, but it is a rabbit. And then everybody tries to beat him down. I mean, it has happened, uh, it seems the most of the noble discoveries were rejected by the journals first time. Okay. Uh, and then what happens is the established guys are very upset and then some kind of battles. Uh, happened uh, and then um, in fact uh, uh, for the when the non normal theory came in fluid mechanics uh, if you see in internet Trafetan has given a presentation he has said that there were wars fought in the conferences and to it was to such an extent that uh, I probably have to edit it out of the TV but uh, the groups were not even talking to each other and really going down the uh, trying to kill each other and so on. Uh, but in the end what happens if there is truth in the new view a new generation will grow up and eventually the oldies will die or retire uh, and then if there is truth the new guys will be opened completely a young guy coming and smiling in the class and then they will come up with this view and given enough time will uh, overthrow the old one and then this view will stay for some time till another set of people come and they come up with a better view and overthrow this and this will go on forever. No, not really overthrow, it will say that it will work for one particular set of things but in general so Newtonian mechanics is one thing um, 
chemical reactions and other things. There are a lot of reaction, uh, a lot of examples. It's really a book worth reading, and I strongly recommend you to uh, read this. So we'll talk about a little paradigm shift in thermoacoustics, where everything was in uh, in the uh, model framework till this dude came. Now, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Kaushik Balsubramanya used to sit in this class, uh, BTEC, uh, and then he said that uh, this normal mode is all uh, not right. I mean, in general, it is non normal. In fact, there is hardly any time when it is normal. And then what happens is papers were shot down, and everybody said that this is nonsense. And, and he did a lot of analytically nice things, and uh, they said you can do analytical thing in 1920, not in 2005. And, and so on, all kinds of nasty things came, but there was truth in it. Eventually, he overcame everything and uh, got his things out. So, this is the first paper in this subject. And uh, this guy, he was a little guy like you. The only difference between you guys and him is that he behaved like a 12th standard student or 11th standard student, not like IIT B Tech, which is a disgusting thing here, IIT B Tech or M Tech or whatever. He behaved like a nice cool kid, and that was the, otherwise, he was just like you guys. And uh, he was really excited about life. and passionate about everything you do and not just science but even playing basketball you would play happily and not uh, uh, I mean not like uh, the B text you think that happiness is a very uncool thing to be or something uh, anyway he did this and uh, he, he is wrote a series of papers I think seven papers while he was here I mean not, not even PhD students do that kind of stuff and uh, so this is really hard paper to read but I invite you to read some of you are good at solving equations he wrote another simple paper so that people can understand if they cannot uh, go through the rigorous maths in the other paper. He con constructed a toy problem. This is really easy going paper and in which he explains things. And even so, uh, uh, if it is really new, I then came another set of DD guys who are also quite like school kids, uh, uh, Sharath and Kushal. Uh, they wrote this paper explaining uh, what is meant by singular value, why singular value characterizes the energy growth and so on. So together with these dudes, I, we engineered at IIT Madras a paradigm shift from normal mode stability analysis to non-normal stability analysis. The subject was born here in our aero building actually. Uh, so we will go through this and the, uh, this paper is uh, really nice. It is really simple and very elegantly written, uh, almost like kids write, which is really nice because then you, they understood and, and so on. Uh, Kaushik's papers are little heavy, he, everything is obvious to him, <laughs> but, uh, but they are nice, I mean really elegantly written and, and so on. So I will, uh, I really invite you to read this paper because sometimes if you see how a subject was born, you should read the first paper in the subject to see how the thinking process is because here is some dude, uh, 19 year old or something taking on Kulik who is 80 year old and saying that uh, what, look I am saying right and you are wrong and then another guy tries to kill him back and so on. So, uh, you know, I, I think you should see that. I mean, so eventually, 10 years later, 20 years later, this will be in textbooks, and it won't be in this form. It will be ordered very nicely, and it will everything. Will, but by the time a textbook is written, you can be convinced that the subject is over. There is no room for you to work. If you work, if you are working in a subject with 10 textbooks, it's it was solved 10 100 years back. The gas dynamics. I mean, everything is done, really. I mean, it's a beautiful subject, but in 1800s or 1900s, if you live, lived it, would have been exciting. Uh, the classical gas dynamics. I mean, now it's 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 perfect. It's a great subject, but I mean, you can't redo fan of flow and Rayleigh flow and all that. Even the unsteady versions are solved. Uh, so everything is solved. But uh, so then you move to a new place where you can make the new things, and then all the initial problems will be solved. Then people do heavy problems. Even the heavy things will be solved. Then you try to uh, play around with a little bit and and, and so on. Uh, so we will try to explain this. Uh, so we have to talk about two concepts of stability. I, I took this slide. Uh, I, this was given to me by my friend and colleague Peter Schmidt from Ecole Polytechnic. He is a collaborator. So he says there is something called linear stability. We are interested in the minimum critical parameter above which a specific initial condition of infinitesimal amplitude grows exponentially. That means just key, look. The key word is infinitesimal. You can be infinitesimal means it can be small and if you have a condition you can still take smaller and still take smaller and still take smaller. Then there is something called energy stability. We are interested in the maximum critical parameter below which a general initial condition of finite amplitude uh, decays monotonically. So that is the other limit. Now if you go to this graph uh, which I showed here. So this uh, if you go by the definition above this 
or to the right of this any parameter will go up and to the left of this anything will die. So, that is the energy stability and this is the linear stability, okay. is that clear. So, now we have to link what, so the, this uh, Peter Schmidt is a guy who kind of engineered the paradigm shift in uh, fluid mechanics, uh, stability analysis in fluid mechanics or concept of turbulence and so on in the 90s. He was a student at MIT, now he is a professor at Equal Polytechnic and uh, they ha had very difficult time in the 90s when the establishment came, uh, came after them and, and then um, really had a hard time. And I think the subject was uh, started probably, I, I do not know the history correct, correctly, I think the first uh, pseudo spectra was perhaps computed in 1970 I think and uh, there were papers from 60s and so on talking about transient growth. I think the first one who probably did mathematically was a person called Shagilish Willi, I do not know, I think you met him when he was here some of you, he was here in January for about a week or so. Uh, George Shagilish Willi, uh, you met him, uh, he uh, did it in astrophysics, accretion disks and so on and, and uh, uh, Schmidt, Henningsen, uh, Reddy, they were the ones in 90s uh, or Farrell uh, or late 80s who did it in fluid mechanics and atmospheric sciences and uh, now it is there in many subjects in thermoacoustics we discovered it first and um, in every subject when this, when this came the subject faced a lot of opposition from the establishment uh, but that is natural anything which is new will face opposition that is what I understood after reading Thomas Kuhn's paper. So going back to what the, so we have to link up this fluid mechanics to what combustion instability people were saying. So in the 60s people talked about triggering instability, there is this rocket and you um, look at it 20 times it is fine, 21st time it blows up and what they do is actually they put a bomb inside the rocket, blow it up and that is like a finite amplitude initial condition and uh, look at it, um, uh, look at whether the uh, rocket is stable or not. So uh, this is the same as subcritical bifurcation in the modern nonlinear dynamics language and that is the same thing which the fluid mechanics people are talking about. So, we have to link what we are seeing here and there and then try to make a picture out of it. So, uh, if you look at that picture of the duck, uh, I mean it stays a duck till you start observing something else. Uh, so, it is the same way, I mean you, you connect things and then suddenly a new picture, it, it is just sudden, it is not like you slowly constructed a rabbit or something, bang when you saw it was a rabbit it just came bang at you right, so that is the way it is, that is the way brain works. <coughs> so uh, we saw that there was this uh, region where there is globally unstable and globally stable and in between there is a region where it is kind of potentially uh, unstable and uh, there is uh, globally unstable, uh, 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 you can construct these regions for various parameters, globally unstable, globally stable and then there is uh, like a region where there is potentially stable. So I give example. Uh, with uh, how students behave in class. Last year I had the great fortune to teach third year VTEX. So in the class uh, about 80 percent of students were always sleeping. So they are like this uh, globally stable region outside, completely uh, sleep whatever you do uh, even before any disturbance is put they are sleeping and whatever even if you burst a bomb they would not know. And there was uh, she sitting in the front always awake, uh, no problem and uh, you do not no matter how bad I teach you will be awake. And there this in between guys, uh, Nafis you are globally stable, uh, this fellow I could wake up Derek uh, and uh, if I yell and scream and so on then bang, oh, uh, right. Shabirish was kind of uh, unstable, he was awake most of the time actually, so close to the half point. So uh, 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 this fellow whenever he came he was awake but many times he was not present. So. Uh, uh, so uh, th this is a good, I mean that is the way I th think of this bi-stable region that some people whatever you do they are sleeping, so they are like stable or you cannot excite them to instability wake up and oh. Uh, some other people they are always awake you do not have to do anything but in between uh, there is this guys like Derek, you, you speak with small disturbance he will be sleeping but you raise your voice and, and throw a chalk at him and all that and ah where am I, okay. So this is like our subcritical system. So these are situations which are I think th teaching third year guys was really great revelation I think I would have been a lesser human being if I did not get to teach you guys. Uh, these are situations which are potentially unstable and the issue is how do you go to instability in a uh, subcritical regime. See if you teach MTEX you do not gain all this fundas about instability because they are always awake. So uh, 
we again go back to this picture that you increase a parameter and first you uh, come all the way here, you jump up, but then you come back, you do not come back straight here, you have to go all the way back and come back here and then only go here. So, this is like I was, uh, uh, I mean you mess up, but you cannot just go back slightly and come back here, you have to undo a lot of things and only then you will fix it. It is just like life, you do one thing and suddenly everything messed up and then you cannot just stop doing that and life will be stable, you have to go back a lot uh, and uh, to clean up your life. So, it is the same way in thermoacoustics. Uh, I, I think that is a very important point in uh, turbo machinery, if not in life. For example, if the uh, gas turbine becomes unstable, usually the controllers would not let it go unstable, they, they sense anything is there and they know the operating point and they would not let you come anywhere close to that, because what is the problem if, this, if it becomes unstable. Then you have to go back all the way to here, you have to cut back a lot and that, that they do not like and generally it could be a super, I mean subcritical bifurcation, then you have to come back all the way. Now, if the instability came on and things became violent and you do not know what is happening, they will shut off the engine and shutting off the engine is um, quite involved, because even if you shut off, it will still run for uh, half an hour, because they have very nice magnetic bearings with almost no resistance will keep running and then they look if anything is there or not and then even if they restart immediately, it will take another half an hour to bring to the full RPM. So, one hour power is lost and this lost power, the gas turbine company has to pay the power company uh, for the lost revenue for this hour. So, the um, lawyers are very smart. Uh, so, it, it is quite important that you do not approach instability at, at all from a commercial point of view. If it is a rocket, it is unstable, then it, it just blows up or it does not go where you want it to go and, and so on. It is much more critical here, at least you can start and bring it back after a half an hour or reduce the power or something you can do. In a rocket, it is just gone, it is gone, you, you do not have a mission then. So, the question is, <coughs> can a small but finite amplitude disturbance cause triggering. So, we are looking at triggering and uh, because we had some combustors which did this triggering that was the motivation when we looked at it and we are looking at uh, how the instability came on. So, I came over this brilliant idea that uh, okay, we, we had non-linear solvers and non-linear solvers were so, so, uh, showing this kind of thing, it grew and came down. So, then, uh, but then some other conditions it came up. So, I would have been okay if it just came down for small amplitudes and went up for large amplitudes, but then before it came down, it actually went up. Then I came up this brilliant thing that oh, non-linearity, I read some popular books about non-linear dynamics for dummies and so on, I said okay, non-linear dynamics can do a lot of things. Let us write a really linearized solver and then we will know for sure, I mean you can remove all these fancy things and then we will see nice decay for small initial condition. You know, Kausik wrote the linearized the solver, my student and it was doing exactly the same thing and the non-linear and linear were pretty much identical, you put them on top, it look the same and, but if you jack up the initial condition, you would go to a, a limit cycle. So, you are exciting almost under small identical amplitudes and uh, linear theory should work, but then linear theory is showing this strange behavior. So, then we decided to look at uh, acoustics uh, uh, equations and see what is happening. So, we write the equations, you can write this in non-dimensional form or dimensional form, it is nice to do in non-dimensional form because uh, I mean it is general right. So, this is the momentum and energy equations, we derived this in the class you remember. You did it sir, but uh, you did not linearize the heat release. Uh, I did not linearize the heat release, but I derived the equation. I mean here, I, I did not write the last one, but I derived these two right, yes okay. So, I think we should look at it, otherwise it is like uh, you, uh, what is that, you, you, you do all this uh, uh, Ramayana story and you ask who is Sita and they say she is a ADMK leader or something, <laughs> should not be like that. Uh, can you please, at least one equation we should be able to do, I mean there is only two equations in uh, acoustics and we should at least do one of them, so it is a shame. Okay. So, we have to edit this part out of the TV, so we have the momentum and energy equation, should I redo it or okay, I will give you this, oh no, I think that is disaster, if you have the scan thing then you will keep it and then bring it in the exam and then at that time you will be wondering what it is, do it. Okay. Uh, so, we have the momentum and energy equation and then we linearize, because is there anything non-linear in this equation other than the heat release. In fact, in the model we derived 
how did heat release go? And we sure help me out. I feel very bad. In the model we derived for Q dot heat release rate, we wrote a model. What kind of nonlinearity was there? We had a, uh, a we said goes like um, um, right. We said this is a function of u of t minus tau. And what sort of function was this? Was it exponential, quadratic, square root, uh, all in all? And I, in fact, what was the correlation called? Heckel's correlation. So I did. Square root. Square root. Yeah. So I think we have to read this. I think otherwise uh, we are not getting anywhere because this whole thing is like okay. I'm telling some story, and but if you cannot relate to it, I think. Vishnu, you are supposed to know everything. That's the name Vishnu means, no? Okay, so. Uh, uh, what is nonlinear here? Other is only Q prime, right? I mean, is there anything else nonlinear? The acoustics is it linear or nonlinear? What? How does it look like? These equations. They're linear. They're linear. Yeah. So because you have just operated on U prime and P prime, that's all. So there's no U do U prime by dou T or or U do do U prime by dou X. In fact, there were nonlinear terms. We threw them out. Yeah. Okay. Hmm? M is a mean flow parameter, it is a parameter not a variable, it is a parameter, M, M is like u bar, so it is linear in u bar, linear in u prime and that uh, we are having a perturbation right on the base flow, so a base flow is a given base flow, right? uh, so we linearize the heat release, so linearizing means you say q dot prime is a times u prime plus b times p prime but to get things look nice you have the scaling parameter and so on but we will not worry about it okay but basically you can take the whole thing as a constant times u prime plus another constant times p prime so now i have recast this equation in this form d dt of something equal to operator times something so this is the dynamical system form and uh, of course the scaling uh, y gamma im u prime and not u prime that's because the norm of this the state vector should go like some energy which is relevant. So, it is like acoustic energy. So, now if you look at the operator assuming r and s were 0 what can you say about it actually it is it will be a it's like a symmetric uh, matrix. It will have uh, it, so it will surely be uh, it will commute with this transpose a a transpose will be equal to a transpose a. Now, because of the r and s if you work out uh, uh, this operator uh, will not commute with itself. So, if you take the operator and let us call the operator A, so A A transpose will not be equal to A transpose A and then you call the operator non normal. If A A transpose equal to A transpose A, when then we say that the operator is normal. So, a system is non normal when the evolution operator does not commute with this adjoint. Okay. If it is a real operator, you can take its transpose, if it is a matrix, and then the uh, d dx will be. Uh, uh, what what is that joint? It will be minus d d x, that joint of the difference operator. Okay, so you can work out in few minutes, and you can show that this will not commute with its adjoint. So thermoacoustic interaction is actually, in general sense, not normal. The only time it becomes normal is when r and s are zero. And even if you have a boundary condition, which is a little bit complicated, more complicated than u prime is zero is or p prime is zero, then these operators at the boundary will change will become unsymmetric and then even that will bring some non normality into the uh, system okay so these things are explained in those references that uh, uh, I, I gave you at the beginning of the class yeah any questions okay so what is this non normality so when i when we started i had never heard this term to be very honest and uh, later on i found out what it was because the strange behavior i saw this growth and decay for the linearized system I found that it was associated with non normality, but uh, in, in, in the presentation you can explain what is non normal and then bring the subject in a very straightforward way, but when you do it first time it is not so straightforward because you hit on some behavior you do not know what it is and it is crazy and you think it did something wrong and later on you find that okay this is what they call that. I will give you another reference uh, which is a very nice reference by Farrell and Iano. Uh, 
they are from uh, where are they Harvard I think I do not have the paper here. Uh, generalized stability theory part 1 autonomous operators there is a part 2 for non autonomous operators also journal of uh, atmospheric sciences volume 53 number 14 uh, page 2025 to 2040. Um, non autonomous operator means the operator is not a function of time non autonomous means the operator itself is a function of time. Uh, so, you can uh, I can give you this paper. Uh, so, we can represent eigen vectors uh, geometrically any vector can be rep I mean represented geometrically. Of course, I cannot represent 10 vectors geometrically in 10 dimensions, but only 2 dimension I can uh, draw geometrically and 3 dimension I can construct with some sticks and, and so on in a you know like you have seen chemistry people construct molecules. So, with that we can do, but at the moment I will stick with uh, uh, 2 vectors. Uh, because it is easy to draw. So, phi 1 and phi 2 are 2 Eigen vectors they represent the Eigen vectors, but the same principle holds for 5000 vectors or 100000 vectors. The phi 1 and phi 2 are dk in fact, if you have any doubt you can bring a ruler and check if the ok sorry if phi 1 is actually coming down from top to bottom same with phi 2 phi 2 is also coming down. So, the blue line is the resultant how do you construct a resultant? in vector algebra you must have studied in uh, uh, parallelogram law there is another law also triangle law. So, we will draw with parallelogram law now and you see that the vectors are shrinking, but the diagonal is growing. Now, had the vectors been orthogonal like this and I shrink my uh, uh, my uh, resultant will also shrink, Okay, but now they are like this and you see this is a problem I mean not a problem. I mean uh, 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 the individual vector shrink that does not necessarily mean that the resultant shrinks. Now, yes as you if they are shrinking and they are shrinking forever and as time tends to infinity phi 1 will become 0, phi 2 will become 0 and the resultant will also be 0 no question about that. So, asymptotically each of the Eigen vectors if each of them are shrinking the resultant will also shrink and tend to 0, but that is only asymptotically, but before it dies it will create some damage and then only it will die. So, in the short term it is going to grow. Now, as a general rule if you have more vectors you will get more transient growth if you have um, 3 you will get more than you can get more transient growth than 2 if you have 100 you will get much more transient growth than what you can get for 2 or 3 if you have uh, 10,000 you will get even more transient growth and so on. So, under these conditions Eigen values are telling only the asymptotic stability asymptotic stability means as time tends to 0 what is the stability. So, Right. Eigen values. It's a one word actually. If the that means as t tends to infinity, what happens? So, if you uh, see in the model analysis we did we were looking at each mode how it is stable how it is unstable. So, you, you, you can have each mode stable you can have all the modes stable, but you still can have some growth that is what is the concept of transient growth you have individually each of them is decaying all are dying at time um, all are dying at that time t equal to infinity, but individually uh, we, we look and everything looks stable, but in a short time or in a transient time there is a growth. Is this concept clear and can you correlate with the uh, geometrical picture I have drawn what is the office just for a moment can you tell me why it does not make sense. So, we are conditioned to think that if individually you reduce the uh, total also reduce, but that need not always be always be true ok. Any other question? You're you draw more pictures it, it is possible that even when they are non-orthogonal you can have them reduce, but I am I have set up example which will grow ok. So, uh, we will go with uh, triangle law this is a slide I wrote from my friend Peter Schmidt again phi 1 minus phi 2 is what you are looking for let us say and the blue vector shows phi 1 minus phi 2 it is uh, pretty clear that phi 1 is coming down phi 2 is also coming down right I mean there is no I mean it is not like I have played a trick here, but the blue 
is actually growing and you can see it is it's really growing and the direction of the resultant also is changing. Okay. So, superposition of decaying eigenvectors can produce growth in short term, although asymptotically you die, but in short term there can be growth and this was not considered till 2007, I mean 2008 Cauchy came with this breakthrough and he showed that it was non-normal under all conceivable conditions, non-normality does not necessarily mean transient growth, under for a non-normal operator can give a transient growth if you start with the right initial conditions. Because See, can you give me a case when you do not have transient growth, even for a non normal operator? When, when will a non normal operator will not give transient growth? That does not guarantee it depends on direction, but there is one case where it is guaranteed. What if you are exciting along one eigenvector? Then you continue to go down shrink in the eigenvector. Eigenvectors evolve independently, right? So I see you you have an initial disturbance and then you project on all the eigenvectors. So if the initial disturbance is along phi 1, so let me draw this. So I have several eigenvectors in all these directions and, and several basis functions and along each basic function I am projecting. So let us say my uh, my entire disturbance is along this eigenvector, so eventually it shrinks, 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 shrinks. So I am actually coming down this way, so I will never grow. Okay. So uh, this was not considered before, but the now it seems like you saw from the operator that uh, I mean as long as you have a heat release you will have non normality. Now non normality does not necessarily mean transient growth, but it depends on what initial condition is there because there clearly I rigged up this picture where your initial condition is uh, along this eigenvector uh, and then you are shrinking in this direction. Whereas I have a picture here on the screen where I have initial condition with projections on this phi 1 and phi 2 and then the resultant blue line is growing. So, both possibilities exist, depends on what is the initial condition. Is this clear? Actually, you have a question. Uh, but here we are not guaranteed because the case and negative non-normal, not guaranteed that there is two linearly independent. Yeah, you can have uh, um, uh, repeated eigenvalues also, that is possible. Then you will surely, it is a possibility. Repeated eigen, like this extreme case would be uh, like degenerate eigenvalues. But generally in my experience so far I have not got repeated eigenvalues, they will always be, I mean they can come very close but not quite repeated, but even if it is repeated same conclusion holds. No, but, uh, there might be a case where you have only one and the eigen space is just of dimension 1. Uh, yeah, in that case you would not have this problem, but in general uh, minimum you have two equations. Even if you do not discredit just even with simple just two equations, you will have two vectors. So. Yeah, I mean, you are in principle right, but in practice, uh, I mean, you have several modes and so on. So, you take a pipe and it has several modes, right? Natural modes itself. So, along near that, there will be if you have heat release, the modes will shift, but that is possible to excite. So, what you are saying is in principle true, but in practice, it is hard to find such a case. So now it strikes on your face that everything is non-normal. If you, uh, but at that time it was quite new. <coughs> so what is the consequence? So I mean, so what if it is non-normal? So what is plotted here is the evolution of acoustic energy for a problem, and you see the dotted line shows the uh, evolution of the linear system. So I have a linear simulation, and I calculate pressure and velocity at every instant, and then I calculate the acoustic energy and plot. And there is some kind of transient growth, and eventually it is dying down as time tends to infinity. But you see now you look at the nonlinear simulation, it also starts about this way, but then it goes off and takes out and uh, just go into uh, a limit cycle starting from small amplitude itself. We are not really bursting a bomb and starting from a high amplitude disturbance, we are starting from a small amplitude disturbance and going to limit cycle. So another way you can think of is you can have a, you can think of a basin of attraction you can imagine something like football or something which is very, uh, very symmetric 
and then in along any direction you excite you will have same distance to cross to be able to get out of the basin of attraction. But let us say if your football is punctured or something like that some side it is compressed and then along some direction you have you need only little bit energy to get out, but along some other direction you need, need a lot of energy to get out. So, if you can find the direction along which you need only small energy to get out then there is a possibility that you can get out uh, easily to uh, out of the basin of attraction. Now, another in way of interpreting is uh, as engineers we are told that 10 percent is some linear thing or something and some other uh, maybe if you study in IIT Madras it is 10 percent if you study in IIT Bombay, Bombay they may say 5 percent is engineering limit below that it is linear above that it is non-linear. But really you cannot say like that because the very fact that you may start with the direction which is even 1 percent or 0.01 percent, but you can have a linear mechanisms have transient growth and take you in time some other per some other time it goes to 5 percentage or something. And then suddenly you are uh, I mean you are still having a linear system, but this mechanism says that the range of validity of linear assumption is not just 5 percent or 10 percent it is subjective. So, non normality actually reduces the range in which linearization is valid. So, that means you may think linear equation should work, but actually non you have to use nonlinear equations and then it is a different ball game altogether is this clear. So, uh, just to emphasize once again classical acoustics is uh, you have all these modes and they evolve independently and uh, they are not. Uh, 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 they are uh, normal modes, but moment you have heat release you really have non normal modes and then uh, uh, yeah I mean it, it makes the acoustic modes non normal or non orthogonal. So, okay, you did all this theoretical concepts and so on and uh, so what is the consequence does it have any I mean okay you can you learned all this in perhaps if you did, did linear algebra you would have learned some of this stuff I learned actually in third semester, but I had no clue it was of any use uh, I had to relearn everything uh, two, 2 3 years back. So, we look at example of a Riki tube we saw uh, in the lab the Riki tube we showed a movie and we will make a simple toy model uh, of the Riki tube and this is following this paper uh, thermoacoustic instability in a Riki tube non normality and non linearity we, we follow this and uh, you can also uh, follow this this paper also uses the very similar model maybe, uh, I mean I think same model, but uh, maybe explain some of the linear concepts uh, a little bit more in, in depth. So, uh, we saw that the Riki tube is nothing but straight piece of pipe it can be a tube or a duct or something square duct the one we saw had a square duct and we have a heating element which was made of wire mesh do you remember all this ok. And there was air flowing how was the air flow set up blower yeah and uh, how is the classical Riki tube it is a vertical and uh, what do you use to set up the air flow natural convection it is always there. So, you do not have to use a blower. Now, if the natural con convection is there already why are we uh, side stepping it we are side stepping it because I do not want to uh, model the effect of natural convection I want the model the sorry. Yeah, so uh, that is one thing if I have uh, what uh, Nafis is saying is if you have a horizontal one then and you are using a blower you can independently vary the heat of power as well as the flow speed. If you have a vertical one the flow speed is uh, you do not need a blower, but your flow speed is linked to natural conversion of course, you can have natural conversion along with that you can blow also, but ok. Uh, uh, but then in theory it is easy to set up the airflow rather than have the natural convection because if you are having a natural convection to model it and so to sidestep it I just do this horizontal thing. Now, um, it is pretty clear that if you ever done anything 
anything that is easy to do experimentally will be difficult to model and anything which is easy to do in theory will be difficult to do experiment. So, we you saw the Riki tube which had so much accessories two decouplers on each side blower and, and so on uh, uh, and you had a uh, separate power supply and, and which would not burn and lots of things. But if it was a horizontal tube all you needed was just a piece of pipe and that is all you do not need any of these accessories that is the way it is okay. So, we take this equations and do you remember we did model analysis and what happened after we did this model analysis, why, why do you do model analysis, yeah I know model analysis so I do. So, there is a saying that if you find a hammer or if you have a hammer you will be finding nails everywhere, so Suji studied model expansion, so wherever it is uh, do model expansion, yes that may be true. If, if you do that what happens, if you drive a nail, okay, nail goes in and you can hang a calendar or something. So, here what happens there, that is one like fun, it is like uh, I ask you where is Anna University, you say it is front of IIT and then I ask you where is IIT, you say it is in front of Anna University. Yeah, you cannot solve the missing matrices, but yeah, it is towards solving. So, what does it become? What are these equations? What are these equations? Ah, and when you do this what happens, OD. you got OD, yeah, so we want to convert PDE to OD and why are we doing this, easier to solve, easier to solve much easier to solve. Okay. So, so we want to solve the acoustic field and I am very very keen that I solve in time domain, why, because I have got crazy because a simple frequency domain solution available, why do not I want to do this. I mean you had the frequency domain solution very nice and elegant McManus had worked it out very nicely. So, why am I insisting on transient solution? Such a solution when there is heat addition like this. Why do you want to study in time? Key is in the word transient. See the variation in time in the other thing. Why? I mean, yeah, I am studying in time domain to see the variation in time. This is back to where is Anna University, where is IIT. Why why should I study in time? The key word is in transients. In frequency domain, you can't get transients. We want transients. So we have to do in time domain. Hmm? Only in time domain you will see this. Well, you can do a Laplace transform and then you may be able to see it, but the Fourier transform I mean it is non causal right there is no, okay. Well, you can in a roundabout way do it, but not in the way we did, okay. So, in summary we take the momentum and energy equation, we assume a compact heat source, this is going by the same exact same derivation that I did and uh, why did we use a delta function here? it is compact, Very, we had a small heater and then we write the expansion and then we use this uh, Haeckel's modified form of King's law to model the heat release that is heat release is a function of velocity at a delayed time and I mentioned that in reality you will have to solve set of PDEs for actually getting this, but we are sidestepping it to make a toy problem so that you can play with it. So, this is the correlation and uh, the three is put in by hand to match some experiments, does this make any sense, you have seen this, yeah this is what I was asking you. So, King's law predicts nonlinearity only for velocity perturbations near or around the mean velocity, but if you use this correlation you will have nonlinearities become important at one third itself, u prime by u bar is one third. So, you do all this uh, algebra and then yeah this is the matrix which you are talking about, you get the equations of the form. A d k over d t plus uh, a operator working on uh, the chi plus uh, another non-linear function of chi equal to 0. So, if you had only well, linear system you will have only the first two terms the last one is the uh, non-linear system.
So, we get evolution equation and this is the uh, language of dynamical systems. Now, in the earlier type of analysis people wrote everything in terms of second order equations, but then if you get it in this form you can use the machinery from dynamical systems straight away. The chi is this eta eta dots. Yeah. Into some chi function of chi, then only it will be a non-linear path. No, this okay. I used a different language that day. Okay, so this whole thing represents that. Okay. Yeah, I had two terms in that. Yeah. So the together, I say it's still a non-linear function. Okay. So in in summary, so we are we explained what is. Uh, normal modes what is non normal modes and uh, what is meant by a non normal operator. We saw that the thermoacoustic system was non normal in general as long as there is a heat release you the system will definitely be non normal. In fact, even non trivial boundary conditions will make it non normal and then there is a possibility that you can have uh, subcritical systems where all the Eigen vectors are decay, but this resultant can grow if they are uh, not. Uh, not normal or not 90 degree not orthogonal and now we will look at the consequences of this uh, of, uh, of this with calculations in a reeky tube and for other systems and then we will I will explain the machinery that we can use to study these things okay thank you.